Large events are an important opportunity to come together to hear about exciting work happening in the community. What we know from our five years of being in communities that there's really good work happening, and part of our mission is to make sure that everyone knows about the good work that's happening. So we know that Elkhart is a tight knit community, and many of you may already know each other, but I do hope that you're able to connect with new people and new programs today. So all of our organizations are strengthened when we look for ways to collaborate. I'd like to take a moment to thank our planning committee, uh, Shin Yi Tan, you can raise your hand, uh, Leah Plank, Natalie Bickle, Jennifer Lefever, Raven Deneer, and Felicia Howell joined Amanda Rhodes and myself in planning today's event. The committee was thoughtful in deciding which keynote speakers, panelists, and resources would make for an interesting rich afternoon. Over 40 programs were invited to participate, and we actually have 32 programs present today. So I think that's amazing. Um, join me and thank you, the committee, for their work. I know that a lot of people have been able to visit the resource tables, and I would encourage you in between the keynote and the panels to please go out and gather information. And there should be a little bit of time at the end of the day to also go back. Um, okay, so just a few logistics. Uh, we will have short breaks in between our sections. And uh, at the end of the event, I would ask if you could do an evaluation on the programs. Hopefully, I don't have one with me, but on the back of the program, there's a QR code. You can use the QR code. Um, anybody who registered as of last night should get an email around 4 o'clock with the evaluation link. So we're trying to make it easy to get people. Um, we actually do incentivize turning into evaluations by the end of the day. We're going to get started to do it today. So, um, I also, uh, we're going to record the event today so that anybody will have access to our YouTube channel. And anybody who registered, I'll send out that link uh, once we have it uploaded. Usually it takes us three or four days to get that ready. But that's open for anybody who's interested. If you hear something today that you want to share with a friend, Share the link, and we're happy to you know, just share whatever is presented today, or everything that's presented today. Um, I really want to thank three of our very hardworking staff and interns, Emily McCool and her boyfriend Nate, did a tremendous amount of work setting up tables earlier. So they're not in the room, but if you want to acknowledge them, we believe they're at our table, the Sunday table. Um, Takesha Jacobs is helping with all of the resources, and Joe is our intern who's helping with the board. So thank you for being here. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Anthem, Ivy Tech, MD Wise, Indiana Tech, and The Source. Um, thank you for making this event possible. So today, our theme is Building Resilience. The afternoon will focus on projects and organizations that help the Elkhart community to be well and to make meaningful growth in the midst of challenging life circumstances. All of the organizations present on our panels and resource tables build resilience in families, individuals, and the community. Our keynote will be given by two champions of self-healing communities. We'll learn more about how the self-healing community model values the richness in all of our endeavors and imagines a way forward where community health and well being improve when we all work together. So, Kimberly Green Reeves, who's Kimberly and Oshana are both in the back. <laughs> Kimberly was raised in South Bend. She's been with Beacon Health System since 2012 as, and starting as an intern. As the director of community impact, uh, she, she's executive director of community impact. 
impact. She's the head of the department overseeing health outreach efforts for Community Hospital of Bremen, Elkhart General Hospital, Memorial Hospital in South Bend, and uh, three rivers held in St. John, Michigan. She ensures, alongside her colleagues, there are effective, equitable, and sustainable models and processes in place to prevent disease and promote health in communities. She manages collaborative work with nonprofit organizations who are committed to improving health outcomes throughout the region. Kimberly received a Bachelor of Arts from Holy Cross College, Notre Dame, and a Master of Public Affairs. Healthcare administration degrees from IUSB. She's also earned a green belt in Lean Six Sigma, which I think is super impressive. Uh, she currently serves on the boards of, of directors for Oakland, the Designated Community Mental Health Center, and United Way of St. Joseph County. Kimberly was recognized for Michiana 40 Under 40 class of 2019 for her leadership both at work and in the community. She also received the Leadership Award in 2020 for the City of South Bend. She and her husband, Steve, have three wonderful daughters. She's excited about the opportunity to do meaningful work across the Michiana region. So, welcome, Kimberly. Presenting alongside Kimberly is Belshana Lucky. Belshana is a native of Detroit, Michigan. In 2002, she moved to South Bend, Indiana, where she began working for the TRIO Upward Bound Program at the University of Notre Dame. In 2006, Belshana joined the University of Notre Dame's Robinson Center Learning, Learning, Robinson Community Learning Center. She quickly became known for her loving yet no-nonsense approach to helping families through the day. While believing their dedication and hard work would bring them great success. Belshana graduated from Central Michigan University with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. In 2009, she earned a Master of Science in Management from, I, from Indiana Wesleyan University and a certification in nonprofit executive leadership from the University of Notre Dame. Belshana is a recipient of the Indiana Torchbearer Award from the Indiana Commission for Women. She's also an Executive Journey Fellow, which is funded by the Lilly Endowment Inc. Fellows are awarded individual renewal scholarships and are supported by fellow youth workers around the state of Indiana. In 2019, Belshana started Pendulum Consulting LLC, which focuses on executive coaching of underrepresented professionals and assisting organizations serving youth and families. Belshana is the Director of Engagement of South Bend Communities of Greater Michigan Movement, a fiscally sponsored nonprofit. Belshana is also founder of a retreat business, Living in the Rest. So welcome, Belshana. Hello, everybody. It's always a little funny to hear your bio being read. But then I also strangely get teary-eyed because I think about what my mother would think. Uh, being in the room because I promise you there were times that she's like, oh, I hope I hope it works out. I hope it works out. <laughs> so um, again, Belshana Lucky, I just want to share what made me fall in love with the brain. So you'll hear me talking a lot about neurobiological care. Um, my mother was diagnosed with, with what was called being cerebellum ataxia, which means the cerebellum portion of your brain is shrinking. Um, and it's hereditary, so I do have two sisters who are going, um, walking through it now. Thankfully, there is a National Ataxia Foundation um, that there are more services today, and we get to learn a lot more. But long before Dr. Nancy Michael, which you'll hear a little bit from in a video, she came to the university, and I was already, like, making sure children and parents knew all these things. That nobody was talking about, but it, it controls every part of our body. And so we started what was called brain health curriculum. And so now all these years later, I get to do this fun stuff with self and communities. And I always say, um, when you see me, you should see this little crown on my head that says self-care queen. Um, and I've been teaching about self-care long before it became a hashtag. And so I always say it's important that we, 
that we don't, don't just talk about this, but we actually live. And so you'll hear a lot about what we are here to do to help build all of you all's capacity and your organizations, how we can come alongside and support you. So I'm excited about being here today. <coughs> My name is Kimberly Green Leeds, and it is a pleasure uh, to be here with you today and to see so many familiar faces and friends. I um, joked with someone today and said, when I need to uh, get a smile, I'll look at you so that you can smile back and I'll know that I'm doing a good job um, up here. I do want to take a moment just to celebrate you all in the room um, for everything that you are doing, specifically in Elkhart County, around building stronger brains, around this idea of building resilience. I know that there's some fantastic work happening, and I don't want to name any and, and forget some, uh, and so I just will leave it at that, that we know that some great work is happening here in Elkhart County, and we are um, elated to be a part of, of such, um, such, such a journey and a movement that is happening right here. I also want to welcome you to um, Beacon uh, Health and Fitness in Elkhart, right? This is a part of um, Beacon Health System, and again, um, this was not something that we could do on our own. It took many uh, individuals and organizations uh, at the table having a conversation that could bring something like this together so we could come together for moments such as this. I want to share with you how we got started in this work of self healing community. So I'm going to take you down a journey, if you will, take you down a story. In 2011, um, there was a young man by the name of Tremel, and Tremel tragically was restrained and beaten to death by his father. And unfortunately, uh, the, the more traumatic part of that story is that authorities were notified. Um, the schools had shared information uh, about Trumel's um, experience and the way that he would show up at school and at class each day. Um, and um, nothing was getting done. DCS went in, and I shouldn't say nothing. I'm sure something was getting done, but not enough. Not enough to save Trumel's life, right? And so that really jarred Beacon at the moment to just really think about what is it that we could be doing differently? Um, how do we show up and uh, be a buffer uh, to someone such as Tremel? And unfortunately, what we recognized at that moment was that the system let him down, let alone, let alone individuals, but system. And so how could we be a part of this system's change? And so at that time, our executive director, Dr. Margot DeMont, I uh, went and visited Dr. Filetti and Dr. Enda at uh, Kaiser Permanente in Southern California, where um, they are the authors of the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And uh, she got to know them a little bit better and understand their approach to addressing mental health differently. And so she came back to the area and said, why don't we um, have the ACEs training? Dr. Enda has an organization called ACE Interface and we could be a part of training 25 individuals on adverse childhood experiences and then assist them with going into other parts of the community to share information. And so that's what we did in 2012. We had to do that because our community health needs assessment that we are commissioned uh, to do by the Affordable Care Act every three years, it showed us that mental health, okay. there it is, showed us that mental health was the second leading priority in our community, and this is St. Joe County at the time. In our community, it was the second leading health factor, um, second to obesity. And so we felt that addressing uh, adverse childhood experiences, because we were able to ask specific questions about that in our needs assessment, was the right way to go. And so then fast forward, in 2015, we did the needs assessment, and still again, mental health was a priority and adverse childhood experiences was still an issue. And so what could we do differently? We were providing the education, we were make, making individuals aware of ACEs and trauma that existed, but we weren't doing enough. We needed to get beyond just education. And so we went after a federal grant addressing childhood trauma, and we won uh, through, the, uh, through Health and Human Services, it's a federal grant, where we were able to go into schools and um, provide services and work with their parents. And we thought we were doing something, and we were. We were pretty proud of that accomplishment, but we got it wrong. We felt like we were gonna go in, or we knew we were gonna go in, and we were gonna do something to them. 
we're going to change them. As a healthcare entity, we, we heal the sick, right? We treat the sick. We understand acute trauma, a bad fall, a car accident, a gunshot wound. We are, we are there to treat the sick. But unfortunately, what we fail to realize is that we weren't just there to do something to them. We needed to do something with them. And so it took us a good year, maybe a little over a year to understand that, to understand that they had been through a lot of things, that they had had a lot of adversity in their life, that experienced a lot of trauma in their life that we could know nothing about. And we had to understand that a little bit better, but then also celebrate the strengths and the expertise that they bring to the conversation and have them be a part of their healing process. We were doing a little bit of damage because when you go in to organizations and schools and you ask questions of parents and children about what they're experiencing at home, we are mandated to report. And so there were uh, individuals that we had to report to DCS. It was like, oh wow, we are doing the opposite. We are causing harm, doing the right thing because we have to report, but then let's walk alongside them, make sure that they have the guidance necessary so that they can get their children back. And so that's where we started to see a shift. And we had to get beyond just providing the education and doing awareness to actually doing something, creating that self-healing community. And so we went back to Dr. Andrew and Laura Porter and said, hey, what do you have on self-healing communities? We noticed an article uh, commissioned by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation where you all are the authors and it's evidence-based when you're talking about self-healing communities. Come back to our area and uh, have a conversation with us. Let's do a workshop. So we did that at IUSB and that's where we invited Elkhart at the time because we were a healthcare system merging with different hospitals and Elkhart General Hospital became one of our hospitals. And so everyone was there, we were having conversations and we were so excited and still we left that saying, okay, now what do we do? Like she came in and she told us what self-healing communities is and it's a movement, it's a culture shift, you know, that you have to recognize the strengths and you have to capitalize on that and you have to do um, checks and balances and it's iterative. You're gonna start, you're gonna fail, you're gonna start again, but still we struggle to understand exactly how to do that. But we did the best that we could. And so from that, um, I ran into, um, just by way of work, Belshana and Dr. Nancy Michael from the University of Notre Dame. And we just had a conversation. Admittedly, they got together um, prior to me approaching them and they had a whole session where they were writing on the wall and excited and tears and crying because we kept seeing tragedy across our communities. And what could we do differently? And so then they pulled me in and said, hey, we have a plan. Right? And we'd like you to be a part of that plan. And so out of that birth, birth what you see today, self-healing communities of greater Michiana, that we'd like to say is not simply a coalition, but a movement, because we are building on all of the expertise and all of the tools and resources that you all today are bringing into the room that we get to celebrate, be a part of, and offer guidance and support in the best way possible. Today's hopes. Want me to touch base on that? All right. So, what we are hoping to do today is to share more with you about how we're building resilience with self healing communities. And then again, to reiterate that you are already a part of this movement and we'd like to show you how. But we also want to make it official. And then we also want to understand this concept of general community capacity. And lastly, talk about how this again is a movement. We are not coming in to do something um, outside of what you all are already doing, but we are asking you to think about how to approach it differently, potentially. And again, how can we come in and be of support to you? And we'll show you how we're doing that. We are gonna have a handout um, at the uh, closing of today's presentation. And we have two questions that we want you to consider as we're presenting today. Question number one, based on your understanding about self-healing communities of Greater Michigan, what topic would you like to know more about? And secondly, please share a topic you would like us to design a resource or presentation around. So just keep those two questions in mind. So Kimberly referred to uh, Dr. Anda and Laura Porter coming and sharing with us about uh, self-healing communities. I will tell you, if I was a part of what happened in Washington State, 
I don't know if I would have had the energy and the fight that I have in this side. I'm sorry, I just saw somebody have to say this is the pandemic. Come on, I'm sorry. <laughs> it distracted me. Didn't see it. Um, so um, I love the fact that there are some people who are meant to be pioneers, and then there are people who are early adapters. And so we are part of the movement of self-healing communities across our nation. A lot of people call it something different. Down in Jefferson County, they call it um, Resilient Jefferson or Jefferson Cares. Um, there's Kiss Up, Strong. Um, there's lots of different things, but we held to the fidelity of the name self-healing communities because we dive into the sciences. And so um, this slide is directly from the research that we will share later that could be shared out. But I just wanted you to know that self the model itself has been uh, proven. It is evidence-based. And so it's exciting that we get to lead and bring that work across our region. Okay, so I'm gonna put my code on. I'm so sorry. All right, so I wanna walk you through self-healing community and uh, the idea and how it works. We start with the center which is the core, and it is our foundation. It's strength-based right there in the yellow there. And again, I can't um, continue to um, just express how important making sure that we acknowledge everyone's efforts and all of their energy um, and expertise and how they support um, all of the work being done, how that's important to the movement going forward, to self healing communities, uh, because we are not doing anything on our own. We have to come in and move even beyond collaborative work, but move into a partnership and really make sure that we can acknowledge where our group, uh, gaps, where our strengths, and then work through those. The other part about strength-based is that um, it's also a meta-leadership. Meta-leadership recognizes that there are organizations that may step up and say, we have the individuals, we actually have the funds and the tools to help you all. So let us help lead in a meta leadership way and then give you all what you need so you can continue. So we're building capacity of others. Trauma informed. Trauma informed is this idea that we are going to mitigate ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and also the effects of trauma. Uh, what we understand is that there is a journey to doing so. And that's where we move over to this side of the screen where we start with trauma aware. And trauma aware is the example that I gave before in terms of just giving the presentation, giving the information, making sure that someone or a community or even yourselves you have the knowledge and, and the understanding. And once you can master that, you move into trauma sensitive. And again, this is iterative. And so it's sometimes not a straight line. Um, you're taking steps forward and taking steps back. Um, but we move into trauma sensitive. And trauma sensitive is all about the individual. It's all about how am I doing? Am I okay? Right? Am, am I, do I have the tools necessary uh, to provide the services and care to clients and their patients in a meaningful way? The example that I have here is I, I was meeting with one of my managers and she says, you know, this individual, when she started out with us, she was doing amazing work. She was showing up one time, she was organized. The patients really enjoyed working with her. And now I just don't know. She's just late. Um, she's argumentative with the rest of the team. Something's going on. I think we may have to move her on. And so I stopped and said, well, have you asked her why? Have you asked her what's going on? Right? Are we in a position where we can do that? Even for our physicians, we talk about compassion fatigue for them. Do they have what they need so that they can show up for the patient in the best way possible? And we understand that sometimes they're met with such urgency and they have to move quickly, but you do have to take a moment to make sure that you're in a safe space with your patient and your client. So being trauma sensitive is very important. And then moving into trauma responsive is making sure that you create an infrastructure and a safe space to be able to do all the things that you learned about trauma sensitive and being trauma aware. And so that might look like making sure that you have um, information that you can share, looking at how you approach your uh, client intake form, making sure that the environment that you have clients in is comfortable and one that is 
um, pleasing to the eye, making sure that you're not doing a cold handoff, but instead a warm handoff. We call it a closed loop referral to make sure that they're getting um, where they need while acknowledging that they may have experienced some trauma, so you have to show up a little bit differently, but you're putting these structures in place. Sometimes that takes processes that need to be created, and other times that takes policies, um, but it's important. And then moving into trauma-informed, make sure that uh, we understand that at that point, it's a culture shift. When someone steps through your doors, they feel it. They understand that this is a trauma-informed place from how they greeted me from the first moment I stepped into their doors. And so that's where um, we work really hard. And again, I know to some I'm preaching to the choir because you all are doing this work very well. Admittedly, again, we can, I said, if we're going to go out there and we're going to talk about being trauma informed, are we? You know, have we, have we done the work? And so we're, I'm, I'm starting small with my department and really we're at trauma aware. Some of us are moving down to trauma sensitive, but it's a work in progress. And I'm okay to acknowledge that, that we have some work to do, but at least we know that we have that work. You have to be intentional. And then moving from there, we get into protective factors. And I won't go into all the ones here on this side, but understand that protective factors are important because that's an essential step to building resilience. Those are how we're going to buffer the toxic stress that someone may encounter. And the interesting thing about what's on the side here is it's free, right? It doesn't cost a thing. We talk about formal and informal supports in mental health. This one is one that we can all work on together. And then lastly, we move into resilience. It builds on top of each other. When you can accomplish and acknowledge that there are strengths and that you can become trauma-informed and utilize the protective factors um, that you have at your disposal, then we're moving into a, a community that has resilience and is resilient to be able, again, to thrive. When you have resilience, you're allowing yourself to be able to cope with the stress that you endure for the present and the future, right? And when we can do that, we allow our nervous system to thrive, which means we're gonna be happier individuals and so will the uh, patients or clients or individuals that you are working with directly. We can all be resilient. The resilient definition, not sure why it keeps going in and out, so I apologize. The resilient definition that we have here um, it's important for us that we have a common language. When we begin talking about uh, trauma-informed care and ACEs, self-healing communities, the one thing that we realized is that we lack the common language across our community. And so we felt it was important um, to be able to create a glossary of terms. My example, again, is working in the healthcare industry. When we talk about trauma, it's acute trauma to them. But there are several different traumas. There's environmental trauma. There's, uh, there's private trauma, there's generational trauma, there's so many different traumas, but when you talk about resilience, we all get to the same thing, right? And so really focusing on the ability again to respond to future and present challenges and making sure that when um, resilience, when you're, when you're practicing resilience, um, stress has to be present, right? You don't get to be resilient without stress. And so it's important, again, that you're going back on those protective factors and coping mechanisms to make sure that you can manage the stress at hand. And all stress is not bad stress. We just want to make sure that we can get through that stress so that we can become resilient. And again, when we can do that, we are protecting our nervous system. Our nervous system is thriving. We are better, um, healthier individuals. And we always say there is no physical health without mental health. Right there, that is so important. And so when you think about how important resilience is and, and how self healing communities can help you get there, we're talking about changing lives. It is that important, not only changing, but saving lives. All right, so you see the common language definition and she showed you the book um, that we have created. We're only able to have the common language definition in the near peace science definition. Anybody heard of near peace before? Yes, you want to yell it out? Okay. <laughs> All right. So you see here is neuroscience, epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences, resilience, and positive childhood experiences. So I am 
um, excited that I actually get to teach a seminar course at Notre Dame now, diving into all of the sciences and the research that supports self-healing communities. And so we could not do this unless we had the partnership with Dr. Nancy Michael. And we are going to watch a video so you can, um, a big part, just really quickly, about the resources, because we are going to dive into it. When we talk about capacity building, how many of you all are in positions and you are like, man, there's so much going on. And there's so much that needs to happen, right? And oftentimes, organizations will then put a demand on you. And you're supposed to find it somewhere. Yeah, uh -huh, I know a little bit, right? So, but here's the thing. When we talk about capacity building, I want you to know that the resources, when you get any resource that we've created or that we can create for you, understand there is, um, by the time you see it printed, it has been researched, edited sometimes, slight little misspellings that get in. But then we have friends like my sister. We got we have the card that's on your seat all the way in California. Like it's everywhere. I sent it to her. She's in Detroit. And she's like, I'm Shana, did you see? You all don't have that version of <laughs> But it has been very, very, very carefully um, created. And there's rich science. Everyone is diving into neuroscience and brain health. And you can get a lot of information, but I can tell you some of it is not always quite how the neural system, the neurobiological needs that we have is not always there. So I do want you to know that by the time you see our stuff, that it has been thoroughly um, worked on. It's fancy. Somebody know what to do that. He's fancy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, don't go too far. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I'm a neuroscience behavior major in the College of Science at the University of Liberty. It's helpful, I know. <laughs> in the classroom, we take the students on a developmental journey. The nervous system doesn't start fully developed. It actually starts really, really immature. If you think about what an infant can do, what a grown up can do, all of that skill development and behavioral development is driven by a developing and maturing nervous system. So the really crazy thing is that the developing nervous system actually has expectations of the environment, of engagement and care and, and exposure to multi-sensory experiences. If we want grown-ups to be a certain way, how do we have to intentionally engage with infants, toddlers, children, teenagers, and grown-ups to build the, the nervous system architecture that underlies the production of those skills later in life. One of the things that I love about being at Notre Dame is that you're, you're invited to ask questions of spirituality and moral value and purpose. It's a guiding point of discussion all throughout the semester because if we're repeatedly spending our time doing nothing but studying and test taking and all of the things that check the box to build our resume, 
how are we encountering the people in our lives and how are we showing our value for solidarity or our value for common good? Most humans exacerbated by COVID did that are coming to the table with some kind of trauma. There's so much of a cultural value system that's like pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Right? It happens to everybody, right? So, and, and we continue to perpetuate harm transgenerationally. This has motivated the development of a community coalition called South Building Communities, an evidence based community capacity building model based off 20 years of data out of Washington State. So, the idea behind self healing is that it's not me needing services from somewhere else, that I have get a choice in my own healing as well. If I am full of self hatred, I will never be able to heal, right? But if I can understand that my brain is molded through interaction with my environment and it's adaptive in these early situations, I might be able to give myself some grace and find motivation and hope in unexpected places that I was not able to. There's this tagline in trauma-informed care, it's not about what's wrong with you, it's about what's happened to you which is really appropriate in capturing this moment of choice where we can react to like, ugh, what's wrong with that person, right? Or you'd be like, wow, they seem really angry. I wonder if they're okay. Because those two different thought processes who had the opportunity to lead to really different strategies of engagement, conflict, or withdrawal. How do I want my students to be different after taking this course? I want them to have moments, and many of them, throughout their lifetimes, where they, where they might run into somebody and have a reaction and then pause and be like, you know what, I had this class this one time. Maybe what's happening here is really what I think. Maybe I need to be the one to take a minute and ask a different question instead of just kind of reacting to and escalating. And you know, I think so many opportunities for connection and communication are prevented and reserved before they even have a chance to grow because we just react so quickly or we judge and, and right there are biases in the neural architecture that that make that a very reasonable thing to do um, but i think understanding the mechanism and the developmental principles that underlie the mature brain function allows us to have a choice in those moments we have the opportunity to better the condition of humans in an active and engaged way. So that's really what I hope to be able to do with my students, to help them to understand that they're more than what they know, but it's how they use what they know to improve the world around us. I think my greatest hope is that they get to have much more of a choice about how they see the world, how they engage with the world. <laughs> oh, I learned something yeah, today. <laughs> okay, we're going to actually move a little bit fast, but again, because of the partnership, and we have students, I supervise um, our internship team, and so the card that you have in front of you one of the things that i like to say that's part of a suite of resources is called brain care is self-care because a lot of times people hear self-care or resilience and you have people who are literally just turning off all oh, that again but i want you to understand that there is deep science in this so just because people might you know shoo it away you know that it is beneficial to your nervous system Okay. So we do have a YouTube channel. There's a podcast coming. And if you have met Dr. Nancy Michael, you really just enjoy listening to her. And so we do have great conversations that are coming out. Um, the book that you have in front of that we mentioned already. And we have a children's book. The first part of the book is um, 
It's called No Snow Day for the Brain, and it has images of what's happening. Anybody see Inside Out? So think about that type of thing. Um, and then the second part of the book dives into um, for what grown us, but you have some younger children who are really curious, and it is at a level that they can understand. We also have, yeah, I'm just going through. Okay. <laughs> we also have brain health for primary caregivers. I don't know about you, but um, I raised my former husband's sister's children, and they came to live with us when they were five and 10. And everybody was like, you all are such great humans. And I was like, but there's stuff going on. And I didn't know about ACEs. And when I first went through the ACEs training, I spent a great deal of time in tears just thinking I would have done such, I would have made such different choices, you know? And so um, this book, dives into attachment and all types of wonderful things. And here's the wonderful thing about this. This isn't just for children. You know, as we get older, we still need some of those things, right? So I, I, um, I think this is a beautiful book that just is beneficial to everybody. And then this is a book that we did in partnership with Imani Unidad. So if you think about um, your idea that you might put on the sheet, if we could start actually passing that out. Um, if you have an idea that you would like to partner with our students or um, our interns or Dr. Michael, there are resources that we can create. We make it available to people all across the nation, but it starts with your organization. Okay. I do want to pause here just a moment because this is important as you think about the worksheet that you're going to have before you. What was unique about this experience here was that Amani Unidad, uh, Deborah Stanley, the executive director, she understood her client. She knew who she was working with and she really wanted them to grasp this idea of neuroscience and that it doesn't have to be this big word um, that they um, are struggling to really understand or feel like they can't understand, but they actually do. Right, that they have every every understanding and expertise offered to them based on their own experiences. And so these were created from them. And so for example, the wisdom from the room were these different comments that were being made in their peer-to-peer -peer circle group, their family <laughs> time, if you will. And it's a gift to each other as they go through day to day, as they go through their life. And then they have different ways that they can tie that back to the neuroscience part of it. And so that's an idea of not only are these resources driving towards building resiliency, but it's doing so in a unique way that's based on your specific needs for your clients and or your associates, your staff. Uh, they may need it too. So I just wanted, that was too important to just zoom uh, by that. And Ubuntu is a culture, it's a culturally uh, African phrase that says, I am because you, because we, I am because we are. Right, and so it's important just to make uh, certain that we're driving that home. Again, building resilience is not just something that you do on your own. It can be at an individual level, but it's absolutely at a community level too. And I have a couple of these here in the room. Uh, and it does feel wonderful when the clients or the participants see their writing or their voice in a book. This is part of the suite that I mentioned to you. You have the card. That's the first thing that we created. And then this is the book for all us neuroscience geeks who really like to dive deeper. For every one of the six points there, um, there's two pages of deep science inside of the book. When I was going through um, my peaceful divorce, there were times that I was like, and this is peaceful, and this is all happening inside of me? Oh my goodness. And there were tough moments that all I could do was reach out for the card, grab my glasses with the other hand, and read the six points and say, what does my body need today? And so again, even though I didn't know all the science behind it, it was very beneficial to my life. We have a children's book. Um, the, all of the research that we did from the brain care is self-care for adults. We now are in partnership with the Indiana ACE Coalition 
So this book we are designing in partnership with them, it will be available on their website. And our hope is with being in partnership with them that we'll be able to have these books all throughout these, the state. Here's the most important thing. We don't earn any money from this. We sell, uh, we print a ton of them. And then when you have access to it, you are paying for the printing cost. That's it. I'm excited about this trip. <laughs> and that is our partnership with the library. And we, uh, we had last year for 10 months, every other week, we met with library staff, the programming team, um, to learn all about what we talked about in trauma aware and trauma sensitive. And then they wrote it into their summer program. And so that was an exciting day. And children would come up to our tables like, is this free? You could just see them so excited. I'm like, yes, take whatever you want. But Jamal might not want you to have them with you. <laughs> and then coming this year, so again, I talk about we spend a lot of time during research. So since 2020, I've been talking about grief. How many of us have gone through a lot of loss? And so last summer, um, our intern team did a deep dive. They're all neuroscience majors at Notre Dame, and they've been researching grief. This coming summer, we're going to start having um, community events and conversations. And so um, if you know anybody who works at the library at Elkhart, I would love to meet them. Um, so it's exciting. Um, our partnership with the library has been a real gift. And then we're having any crocheters knitters, needlepoint people in a row. So we have a world-class fencer from the Canadian team who is um, on our internship team. And when she gets stressed, guess what? She knits. And so I asked her, um, and I'm a crocheter, if she could put together a presentation. And so we will be going throughout the community this summer doing a presentation on handcrafts and the brain. Thank you for all the wonderful things that you do. And you have your sheet in your hand. If you can please take out the time to fill it out. And we really do take a look at your answers. Absolutely. So we'll open the floor up to questions. Do you have a contact at Ocean Library? We do not, but we'd love one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And plus, that would bring me closer to my favorite pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What about like scavenging authors? Make it happen. Seriously, if you want me, if you can help make connections, if you can write that on there, um, but make sure you put your contact because I want to connect with you, and then we collectively can connect with your local community. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Any other questions? Um, how have you guys seen uh, neurodiversity influence resilience, and is there any curriculum we have on that for research? No, we don't. But please write that down. Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> Um, it is becoming a bigger conversation. A lot of this is also driven by our students' interests and desires, so um, that could be really helpful. I, I just had a question. There were a lot of resources that you referenced, so are there things that I can distribute after the event to make the reaction? Yes, so one of the big things is we use what's called lulu.com for our distribution, mainly because of the cost, but it's very hard to find our resources. So we just recently created a link tree. And so we are having, there's some flyers out front, um, the brain fair, brain health fair um, at Howard Park in South Bend on Saturday. We will have some resources there, but we will have a link and you can um, find all of our resources. If you get in touch with, go ahead. I, was just say, I would also add that our website, South Point Community's website, it's coming. it's coming. It will be launched soon in days, right? Hopefully. Yes. And so um, you'll have access to the resources through the website as well. 
some of them aren't there only because it's, the file is so large, but we also try to print quite a bit. My back of my truck is a store, so <laughs> you don't have to pay for it. I give them away. Well, again, thank you for everything that you do. And again, you're already part of the movement. So we look forward to connecting with you more. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have uh, just a short break when we get the panel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Lovely to see your faces. Oh, I heard one. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Ooh. My name is Kelly Brim, and I'm on the advocacy team of the board of the panel. We welcome you. We thank you for coming out. It's lovely to see your faces. We are delighted to welcome three amazing speakers representing three community organizations whose initiatives help build resilience to adults and families in Michigan. Thank you. We will hear about each of their programs and we'll start time after all three panelists have spoken with questions from the audience. Today, we welcome Amber Terry. Amber is the Divisional Director of B Connect, which is part of Liberal Industries in Michiana. Welcome. We welcome Leah Plank. Lee is Senior Director of Parent and Family Systems and Acting Director of Triple B Elkhart County, an initiative of Horizon Educational Alliance. Welcome. We also welcome Carrie Zipperboos. Carrie is the Executive Director of Spa Women's Ministry Homes. Thank you for being here today. Hi everyone. So I am Andrew Terry, obviously, right? I am the divisional director for We Connect at the Board of of Michigan. And I'm sure most of you are like, what is that? Uh, so We Connect is really a program where we are going into companies and employers across our 16 counties. We're pretty much focused around the Fort County, St. Joseph County and Elkhart counties. And we're going to be providing employee assistance in a really different model compared to your normal employee assistance program. So we do what is called a success coach model. And so what is a success coach, right? A success coach is your cheerleader. That is your person who you can go to and you can say, hey, this is going on in my life. I'm going to go work again. Um, I got my kids upset all the time. My lights are about to be turned off. I don't even know how I'm going to make it to work tomorrow. There's not enough gas in my car. And that success coach makes connections out to people like you and other partner agencies to help <laughs> kind of bridge that barrier that exists for them so they can go to work and be impactful but they have that true leader in their corner who's gonna make that connection, that warm hand off, right? That's the key. Anyone can Google like what food pantry exists and oh, my lights are about to be turned off, who can do it? But that success coach has built partners and relationships in the community that not only do we know who we're calling, we know who's gonna pick up on the other end of the phone. And so that handoff isn't, hey, why don't you go ahead and contact you know, Salvation Army? Or your township trustee but i can do that intake form for you while you're here i'll send it off and all you have to do is show up how impactful is that for someone right we're making them resilient we're giving them the tools we're holding them accountable we want them to go and show up to the meeting we want them to tell the truth when they're there about their situation and what's going on but then we're able to address what happened to get you here in the first place and that's building resiliency. That's giving someone the tools to make a change in their life, to be impactful, not just for them, but for their family, for their kids, and also for their employer and for the community. So a success coach really acts as a liaison between employees and their human resource departments. We need them one-on-one -on -one during working hours. So a success coach is going on site. Um, conveniently, we do partner with Beacon Health Systems. We work with their environmental services team. Um, for both South Bend Memorial and Elkhart General. And so we're there during break and ship change. We're there to be the familiar face for them. We want to have them trust us, right? Most of this is trust-based. 
if you don't know me, you're not going to tell me, and you're not going to trust that I'm going to have the back, and I'm going to make that connection for you. We also know that the agencies that we go to for help, they're working nine to five too, right? So when are they going to go? And that's the key. We're doing it for them at work so that they can go home and not have to stress or come through the work door. And then we have them struggling, right? Because it doesn't stop, right? How many of us can walk into our employer and turn off what went on before we got here? Can anybody do it? If you can, please raise your hand because I would like to meet you because I want to learn the secret. We can't. Whatever has happened within the five minutes, the hour, the day's proceeding doesn't stop just because we're at work. And so we have partnered with employers who get that and who want to be providing that assistance to their employees. And we also make sure that we're bringing additional education pieces to employers and their employees. So under WeConnect, um, we actually are able to help with all of these things, right? Your housing, your child care, transportation, right? The barriers that exist. But we want to do the good things. You want to go back to college and get your degree? You want to get a certification? Hey, maybe you didn't get your diploma, you know, like everybody else at 18. Let's get you into the Excel centers. Let's get you a high school diploma. You don't like your current position in manufacturing, maybe, and you're like, this isn't it for me, but IT interests me. Great. Let's get you connected. So we make the connections within our other programs at Goodwill to help people achieve what their goal is. What is it for you? What motivates you? What drives you? Mental health after COVID became probably one of the biggest things that we actually get asked for. And not necessarily asked, but we get the breadcrumbs. The, man, I'm just not happy. I'm not satisfied. Nothing's bringing me joy. I don't know what to do. I don't know what it is. We take that and we go, okay, so what's going on? We then make the referrals as needed to agencies out to do assessments if they're needed for suicide prevention and awareness. We're making those referrals to mental health providers to make sure that they're getting connected to the help that they need. We also help them with financial assistance if they want to quit smoking. We help connect them to smoking cessation classes. Uh, we do so many things. It doesn't matter what comes our way. It could be you don't have time to look up a rental car for your vacation in two weeks, and we're going to do it, right? I know if that was my only problem in life, that I don't have time to look up a rental car, that would be great. But we know it exists. At Goodwill, we realized that we're doing this in the community, right? We're going into employers, uh, but we weren't doing it ourselves. And we actually launched a success coach program internally. So all of our employees have access to a success coach, regardless of where they work at in our company. They could be in programming, they could work in our stores, they could be a drive-through attendant. Even in human resources, they might need a success coach to help them, right? We're doing it internally too, and the impact that we can see, not only just for our own employees, but for the members of our community has really lasting effects. So we've been doing this since 2019. Um, we Connect actually came out of LaBorte County specifically, which is where I'm from. And we came to Goodwill in October. And we, as you can see, helped 33 people from October to December. And for those employees that we helped, we retained 97.5 of them, which means that if they had contact with a success coach, they were still working. In 2020, right, that nice big shift that we all got, we had 73 users. We had an 86% retention rate through a pandemic, which I think is pretty impressive if I say so. In 2021, we had 156 users with an 88% retention rate and 167 people asked us to help them multiple times. That means that we bridged the gap, we met the need, and then something else happened. Or in that conversation, there were a multitude of things that came up. Oh, it's not just they don't have childcare, but 
My car has an engine that needs to replace. My brakes are going out. I'm behind on my rent. I just got an eviction notice. 167 people came back. In 2022, we had 233 users of our program and 109 repeat users with a 90% retention rate. In 2022, we worked with 13 companies across LaPorte County, Lake County, Elkhart, and St. Joseph. If that doesn't tell you how many people have stuff going on at work who need help, I don't know what will. <clears throat> this program is really built to help people succeed. Um, we want them to be resilient. We want them to know what got you in that situation. How can we make it better for you? It's about the education. But that also means we have to educate our employers too, right? Because our employers sometimes don't get what goes on. If you didn't grow up in daily instability or poverty, you don't get that mindset because you've not experienced it. And it's about survival, right? It's the trauma. It's what can I do today for somebody else? Because tomorrow I might need a favor from you. And we don't get that. What we see is when well, you didn't come to work today, you wanted to go help your friend move, right? I thought you wanted more hours. Yeah, they did. But then they also know that that friend on Friday is probably going to watch their child so they can come to work because they helped them move on Tuesday. That's a real life scenario, by the way. I didn't just come up with that in my head. That has occurred. And so we train not only our employers, but also our community through Bridges. Um, we offer workplace stability, which is really truly meant for employers, but we also do it with nonprofit organizations. And it really teaches you about the communication aspect that exists as far as hidden rules, the communication styles, and the best practices for communication when it relates to individuals who are going through daily instability. We talk about management, how can we improve the stability in our workforce, but also for the participants and clients that you're serving, right? If we don't know exactly how things are being processed, we could be going down the way wrong track for providing support to them. We identify the 11 essential resources and what happens for someone when they're missing just one. And then it actually really goes into the cost of turnover and what it costs for an employer to lose someone. And very recently, uh, we conveniently went and were certified in Elkhart to be a first aider. I went with one of my partners and we came back to Google and said, we should do this. So we are now able to offer mental health first aid. Um, we provide the training and we can certify anybody for up to three years to be a first aider. Um, this training is really meant for anybody who's working with someone who might have aspects of mental health. How do you respond in a crisis or a challenge? Do you recognize the signs and symptoms? Do you know how to make a connection for someone who needs help? And also self-care from our self-care queen who is up here. Do you know the importance of self-care? So we at Goodwill also are doing this with all of our employees internally. So if you work at Goodwill and you manage, supervise, or work with a participant, you're certified as a first aider. Um, so this is a really quick tool for us and what I do and how we're trying to build resiliency for the members of your community. And I really thank you guys for your time. My contact information is up here. Um, please feel free to reach out with any questions you have. Uh, you also can go to our Google website and all of the information and email is there as well. All right, I'm going to play. Thank you so much for hanging in there this afternoon. This is going to be a, uh, I'm excited for all of the presenters today. How many of you, the show of hands, are familiar with Triple P Positive Parenting? Okay, well, I hope that you're all going to learn something more about it today. Uh, how many of you often think about Triple P Positive Parenting or, pos or parenting in general in relation to mental health? Excellent, good. We're, we're in great company. 
So earlier in the presentation, you heard about cases, you heard about Dr. Anda and Dr. Lisa Paletti, and I think that this quote just speaks to the, my heart so much. Um, if we can really get in there and support parents and that critical time of life when they're raising our next generation, the things we can do. And we're so lucky in this community to have a system of support for parents. It's called Triple P, Positive Parenting Program. That's the three P's. Positive Parenting Program. Easier to say. How many of you knew that was Positive Parenting Program? Good, excellent. All right. So, why do we need programs like Triple P in our community? Um, I love Triple P. Uh, it's a worldwide program. That's often not something that individuals um, are often aware of. It's in multiple countries um, around the globe. It's an effective universal prevention program for parenting. Uh, we reach a broad population of parents and we meet the needs of many diverse families. We do provide our services almost 98% in English and Spanish in our community and we do have other resources available as needed um, for families who might fall out of those language needs. Uh, our primary focus is to increase parents' use of positive parenting practices. Um, we know that kindness matters, and especially with our kiddos, so we're here to help you with those practices. We see long-term uh, improvements in child behavior and increases in emotional well-being for not just children, but their caregivers. When you're empowered as a parent and can handle difficult situations, that translates to your children as well. And then we have uh, existing programs to help when there's conflict between partners over parenting. Uh, sometimes we don't have um, the models that we want. It, life throws us curveballs. So we're there to support you during those transition times as well. Triple P focuses on primarily zero to 12. Uh, that's we follow the developmental stages, ages and stages for children. Uh, and then we also have separate programming designed for teenagers and then a whole other set of information uh, and, and classes designed for those who have children with a developmental disability. Uh, we also, again, have uh, classes through some of our partners that are designed for those transition times for separation or divorce uh, to help you make that as peaceful transition for your children as you can. Um, as well as if you're having high conflict um, partner problems for their support you for those needs as well. So if you're familiar with Triple P, you may have encountered a group at a library, or maybe you know of our core partners over at CAPS who need our longer term 10-week uh, groups. The way Triple P is designed is a public health model where we seek to support parents at every level, no matter what they need. So, we have broad services for parents who just want to focus on raising confident, competent children. Uh, our, our primary focus is pre preventing issues before they arise. So we know we can get in there and support those positive parenting programs. Go ahead. We can support those positive parenting practices. At the bottom of the pyramid here, we're less likely to even see issues arise. However, we have interventions designed all along with the trajectory of whatever parents might need, whatever they're experiencing. We don't do this all on our own. Uh, Horizon Education Alliance is the backbone implementer for Triple P Positive Parenting out for our county, but we do this through a wide variety of partners. We work with 13 sectors who have access to parents, uh, and through those partnerships, we have uh, agencies and community organizations that host um, and have workshops there, or they refer into our system. We also have implementers who uh, see a couple in the room who are facilitators who are able to provide Triple P within their institutions and agencies. They also can still host us in and refer into the system. And then right in the core um, that makes the entire pyramid complete, I don't know why that's happening, uh, that makes the pyramid complete uh, is our good partners, CAPS Child and Parent Services. CAPS had long had the infrastructure already in place to do multi-level intervention courses over time. So they do their parenting uh, more in-depth in interventions for our levels four and five. And so together between the work that we're doing at HEA and CAPS, we make sure that that entire system is available in our community. And we are unique in that. That doesn't exist all across the country. Some public health just do one-time workshops, and they don't have all those varying levels. So we're really happy it's taken us eight years to get that all built and integrated and, 
And we have a great system here that I hope many of you um, will refer and utilize. So you can see uh, we have a, a goal of reaching about a thousand parents a year, and we were doing pretty well up until uh, the pandemic. Uh, and then things kind of just trickled down a little bit, but we are on our way back up and I hope just by being here today and informing you and reminding you of the importance of positive parenting and supporting parents and being here as a resource to our community uh, that you will share the information widely and, and participate in our services. So I was excited uh, that self healing communities was here to talk about resilience, and I should have used the definition from the pink book. I, as I saw that, I was like, oh no, my definition is a different definition from a different framework, but it's still very valid and good. So when we think about resilience and the process of managing stress and functioning well, like we want parents when they're struggling, when there's challenges, to be able to move through those and gain that resilience, right? Often, again, we want to prevent problems before they happen, but many, many times parents come to us because they're experiencing challenges. And then they get those little wins. And they're like, wait a minute, I got this, I can do this. And they start building that resilience and they come back and they engage more. And then they start telling their friends. And it is just one of the most beautiful things when we have a parent who initially might not be very sure about um, their ability to manage their children or something new has happened and they come out on the other side and say if i had only known about this sooner and if, if i had a nickel for every time somebody said that i would literally have thousands and thousands of dollars like if i only knew about this sooner so help families know about this sooner right a big piece of what we're here to do is normalizing we're a community that's responsive to the needs of our community like we're parents we're here for that um, and there's unfortunately still a lot of stigma around seeking support around parenting. Uh, but the more we keep at it, the more we can change those norms. And so I, I'm relying on all of you to help us with that message. Uh, Kimberly and Moshana also talked about um, protective factors. We use a little bit different framework. There's, they talked about six, we're gonna talk about five. They're all very valid and they're all built in here. Um, and we use a strengthening families protected factors approach. Um, and within Triple P, within our programming, we're doing all of those things that they've highlighted to help build and support protective factors. And these are the five. Um, I think the one that was missing was nurturing and attachment. And we like to build that in with knowledge of parenting and child development and social and emotional competence of children. So we're not, not doing that. We just sort of build them into these other components. So in Triple P, Primarily what we're doing is helping build knowledge of parenting and child development. We have parents joining us um, when they're brand new parents, first time parents, having second babies. Uh, maybe everything went right and now you have a teenager who's testing some limits and they join us in the teen years. Um, or maybe you become a blended family and you didn't have children before and you wanna just learn a bunch of new tools. Uh, we're there to support parents um, in building stronger, more fulfilling family relationships. How does it so a protective factor in and of itself is resilience and we seek to build parental resilience they're coming to us through challenges they get those little wins they're moving through they're getting those small but sometimes they even get really big wins so by choosing strategies to promote positive behavior on their children parents reduce their own anxiety and gain that parental confidence and then they know they can go forward and be successful in the future right that moving through those those trying times and building that resilience Again, the bottom of our pyramid, spending quality time with your children, tuning in, being sensitive to the emotional needs of your children. Um, children whose parents attend Triple P often are shown to have better improved social skills, better mental health outcomes, uh, and then just the joy of parenting. You can just see that families are enjoying their time together. We exist in a group format. We also do one-on-one -on -one services and through our groups, we're providing social connections. Uh, through social connections, they're meeting together, you're finding common ground. We're huge proponents of peer-to-peer -peer learning. You are not alone, right? You're in a group with others who are experiencing the same thing. That's very powerful. Suddenly it's like, oh, I'm not the only one. And we're support, we're concrete support. We're there and we're all through the community. We should be. Uh, we have throughout the county, you should be accessible to parents wherever they might um, go or want us. And if you don't 
have trouble feeding in your community and you want it, please let me know. Trisha Lightfoot is out at our table. She's one of our great implementers and practitioners. This is just an idea of like when we think of traditional mental health, like I just wanted to highlight that we do have particular uh, workshops that focus on common topics that are very mental health related, but we also talk about body training and just getting along with your co-parent um, and managing dysobias, a lot of other things too. So a lot going on and wrapped up in um, our workshops. And our workshops can be a one-time 60 minute workshop, we can come and do four or five sessions, or we can do 10 to eight weeks. It's really, again, tailored to what families need, where they need it, when they need it, how they need it. So if you've not been to our website, I invite you to check it out. We usually have three months of workshops posted at any given time. Uh, the library in Napanee is hosting a lovely series for us right now that's just kicked off. So if you live in Napanee, you're at your library at least once a month for the next several, several months. Uh, we do have two websites, one in English and in Spanish, so please share this information. We have a bilingual phone line. Maybe you don't know and you're doing a soft handoff. You're like, let's call together, or I'm going to call and get you connected. We have a bilingual phone line. You're not really sure. Annabelle is happy to talk with you and figure out what you need. We invite you to, this is, I don't even know if this works. We didn't try this, but if you don't already receive our Triple P newsletter, I invite you to sign up. Um, and visit our website. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary. So I was thinking about how I wanted to spend a few minutes with you. Um, and I think what I wanted to do as I was preparing for today is just have a heart to heart with you. Um, because I know that addiction is something that impacts families. And I think very few people or very few families, I should say, um, go untouched. And that if by a show of hands, I would assume that many of you know someone who is struggling or who has struggled with some type of hurt or addiction. Um, so I just wanted, I've been at SPO in this ministry homes for nine years, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do, but let me put this in perspective for you just a bit. There was a story, one of our ladies, I'll never forget this. Um, her name was Mina. This is a story she shares publicly. I'm just gonna share a little bit of it with you. I'll never forget when we went into Trinity Lutheran Church and we were there, and a few of our ladies were sharing their stories. And there's just something that had never happened. This is something that the church was allowing us to come in and do. And Mina stood up and she shared her story. And she talked about the fact that she grew up in what appeared to be a really solid, healthy family. Matter of fact, her father was the deacon of her church. But when you hear her story, she'd also share about how when they were prepared to go to church, that everyone would just put on their mask and you would go to church and you would do what you needed to do and you'd put your best foot forward. Um, but when they got home, she was being sexually abused by her father. Now, what do you do with that? When your father is the deacon of the church and he is the very person who is abusing how do you share that story? Is it believable? How is it going to be received? And that hurt went with her. She grew up, she went through college, and then it hit her. And so for her, so that she could roll out of bed, just like the rest of us want to roll out of bed, and we just beg to have one normal day where things work out and we feel okay, she was no different. And so for her, she turned to drugs. And that ended up into heroin, and that ended up uh, in her coming to a really dark place in her life. Things were unraveling. That perfect little family wasn't so perfect after all. That was me. Then I remember Jill, and I remember Jill coming to spa, and you have those conversations because one of the things you realize is that, you know, we talk about resilience, where does it start? Well, I think it starts with a realization that you have to surrender. It's not working. And I remember talking to Jill and I said, what was your rock bottom? 
Because a lot of folks change starts when you hit that rock bottom. And she shared the fact um, she had a rough upbringing. I'm, I'm putting a long story into a short little box, small box for you, but horrible upbringing. Life was unfolding. She was starting down the path of drugs and addiction just too because of the trauma that she had experienced at a very young age. And then it culminated into a point where she was gang raped, left in an alley for dead, raped at gunpoint. And she said, you know what? That wasn't my rock bottom. So how can that not be your person's rock bottom? But when your life has been so, when you have experienced hurt after hurt after hurt after hurt, for her, in some ways, and I don't say this casually, but it was another day another experience, another her, just to add to the basket full of hurts for her. That was her North Bottom. And I remember another young lady, I'll never forget this. This is one of those learning moments for me. I remember talking to her and she came up and she said, Carrie, I'm loving this. I've got my skirt on, I'm looking great. So this is a big deal. And I'm thinking for someone who you'll never catch me wearing a skirt unless I'm going to a wedding. <laughs> You know, I love my pants. I'm sitting here like, what's the big deal with wearing a skirt? And I almost said it in that way. And now I wish I hadn't because she said to me, you don't understand. When I was a kid, my parents trafficked me. And they, when my mom wanted drugs, she would take me out. I was about eight years old. And she, I always knew when mom put me in the skirt that I was going to be trafficked, sold for sex so that she could have the drugs that she desired. And wow, what a wake up call for me. She said, today's a new day. I can wear a skirt and I do not define myself. This is not hurt for me because I'm a new person. I look at myself different. How do you bounce that from really hard things? The families that we're working with have gone through really hard things. If you sat with me for coffee, I could tell you about hills and valleys. If I sat with you for coffee and we had a heart to heart, you could tell me about hills and valleys. You could tell me there's not one person in here who hasn't gone through something or hasn't had a child that you've had to navigate through some really difficult things and decisions. We've gone through hard things. How are you resilient when life is beating you down time and time again? And I realized with our ladies, for them, resilience started with surrender. You just had to surrender it. I know as a parent, there are times I've had to just absolutely surrender. Didn't matter what I said or what I did, I had to just surrender this. Now for me, I'm gonna take you to church for a minute. For me, I had to surrender this to God. And for our ladies, I had to surrender. You know, like, can I get up if I just do this one more thing and say this one more thing and make this one more decision and go to this one more place and have this one more conversation? If I just do these things. So sometimes you just have to say, what I'm doing is not working. <laughs> I need help. And for our ladies, the start of resilience for them was truly saying, life is not working. And I really need help. I really need a community. So... That's what we are. Spa Women's Ministry Home stands for Spiritual and Personal Adjustments Women's Ministry Home. And if we start there, first thing is surrender. You make a choice that life you want, a desire that life can look different. But you also know that life can't be lived alone. None of us can do this alone. And so you reach out for help. Now we say that everybody who comes through our doors, we're going to meet them right where we are. Because we have this big sign that says, come as you are. Come as you are. People ask Carrie, what if they have a cell phone? Come as you are. What if, because you're a Christian ministry, what if they're atheists? Come as you are. What if they have stolen or they have done this or that we can go through a long list? Come as you are, come as you are, and let us walk alongside you. Who we are, 12 month Christ centered residential ministry. We're probably located five, six, seven minutes from here. Um, we have a home that houses 20 women, another home that houses 10. And when women come through our door, they're committing to a year-long journey with us. And it's hard. And it's messy. And there's hurt. But our heart is to let these ladies know and these families know that they're loved, that they're seen. I'll never forget the first story I was telling you, Mina. 
when she had to go through the reality of the fact that her family tried to be perfect in so many situations and they were just wearing this mask. The moment it changed for her, she came to our doors and when she was doing that presentation, I'll never forget when she sat down, the pastor came up to the podium and said, you know, your father may never apologize to you for what he did. But as a member of the church, as a father, as a man, we are so sorry. We are so sorry for what happened to you. And I remember asking her, like, what was that for you? Game changer. Because she needed to be seen right where she was, right the reality of what it was, and she needed to be vulnerable. She opted to be vulnerable. She was seen and loved, and her healing started. So when people come to spa, that's our heart. We want to see you right where you are. We want to meet you right where you are, and we want to walk this journey. And we're going to do it in real practical ways. Um, if people come into our home and they commit to this year, we provide everything from counseling, case management to work with the practical stuff of life, parenting classes, cooking classes, job placement, transportation, mentorship program, recovery groups, individual Bible study, trauma informed care. Uh, the list goes on and on. We meet you where you are and we're going to surround you with resources, but most important, we're going to surround you with people who are invested, who will walk it out with you in the messy. And you will continue. You're not just a number when you walk through the door. You're entering a place where you can really take the journey. Um, while they're with us in this year, they're going to take that journey with us. It's a lot on their part. These are folks who struggle with addiction. Okay, so we have drug testing. I mean, there's some realities to this. But there's accountability that's built into what we do. Here's what I say. I just have a couple minutes left with you. What my heart is in this talk is just to let you know that if there's someone struggling, I want you to know that there's help. And we're going to meet people in their messy, and we're going to walk with them. And we're going to walk side by side because we all have messy. <laughs> we're going to, our heart is to share Christ with these ladies. Our heart is to pour our love and time to these ladies and to get really real and have hard conversations with these ladies. And in that year that they're living in our home, like I said, we have a home that houses 20. We have another home that houses 10, so we're housing 30 women. Um, we're going to be there with them through all of those services and much more that I had shared with you. And we're going to walk with them. Money is not an option. We're never going to say no because they're not in a financial position um, to pay for these services. Our doors are open. So we are going to have a time of questions. I just wanted to share with you some of give you perspective as to who walks through our doors because I know you may know someone who needs this kind of help. And if there are specific things that you would like to know about how we're helping women struggling with addiction and what that year-long journey looks like, definitely pepper me with questions or meet with me afterwards so I can really speak specifically to those things for you or for your family member or for your friends. All right. All right. Thank you so much. so much. We really appreciate the work that you're doing. Your organizations are making a difference, and we see it. So we see you, and we thank you. We appreciate that. So if there's anyone that has a question, you can come up and be here. Take a few questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you. There it is. Um, People needed to have be detoxed before the program. Yeah, that's a good question. Let me turn this on. Um, so the question is whether someone needs to be detoxed. Here's the reality. So we asked them to take, we know that detox is year to two year process, a true detox. But we do ask them to take a few days. We don't necessarily want them using, that's a joke of a request. Because the truth is that we have people who come to us, they take their last hit in the parking lot and they walk through our doors. That's the reality. So yes, we ask and we send them to detox centers at times. We have a list of different detox centers that we will use, um, utilize, especially if it's alcohol. If it's alcohol, um, it can get dangerous. 
Um, so we look at all of the, those things, um, but we also live in the reality that someone probably used right before they stepped through our doors. And we have, we just work with that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's hard. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. Are there any more questions in the audience? I want to, uh, Guys, what's up, people? Somebody told me they didn't go over in this woods. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And so the truth is, is that many people who struggle with addiction <laughs> are struggling with mental health uh, struggles of various kinds. That's a reality too, right? Let's talk real. Um, so absolutely. And if it's bigger than us, you know, we will have somebody who will step in that they'll have outside support. Uh, depending on what they're navigating through. Here's the funny thing, though, and I'll speak to this real quickly. When someone comes in, they're struggling with addiction. It may very well look like a mental health issue, um, which is really a symptom of using meth for 10 years. And when they start to heal and they have time and what they're doing in that time, suddenly, no, that's not what they're dealing with at all. It was really um, what it looked like because of the trauma and the addiction. But yes, absolutely, we get that. The only time we uh, turn someone away, and I remember nine years there, I can think of two or three times, is we're not a medical facility. We've had individuals who truly needed to be in rehab or nursing facility. Um, or if someone comes to us and they're dealing with paranoia to the degree that group living is not appropriate. It's too much. We're doing more harm than good. And I've seen that about three times in nine years that we've turned someone away. Um, but for the most part, our doors are wide open and people can start the journey with us. Thank you. Are there any more questions in the audience? A few more minutes. <coughs> I do want to remind you to visit uh, the resource tables before the next panel begins. Thank you. We still do have a couple of minutes for questions in the audience. So Amber, I love that Goodwill Industries is providing support to people who are, you know, entering the workforce or trying to succeed in the workforce. What I think I was just one clarification on is it, it sounds like it's not just Goodwill as an employer, but you're actually going into other employers as well in the region. Yeah, so we connect specifically contracts with employers. Um, so we work with Heath and Health Systems and their Environmental Services Department in this region. We work with with Wellness Pet, we work with B&B Molders, and we also work with Notre Dame University. Um, we serve a couple of their departments as well out in this region. So we are going in providing the support, um, being that employee assistance program and that resource for their employees to succeed so that when they're coming to work, they're able to be actually at work, not their bodies at work, but their mind is elsewhere focusing on the stress of life. And we know the most people lose employment due to very specific things like their child care and transportation. And my lights went out last night. And so now I've got to try and figure that out today. So I'm not coming to work today, but I'm not going to call you as my employer and tell you why I'm not coming. I'm, I may just not call the show and you're going to give me a point. And so that's where we're coming in. Those employers can actually make referrals to us too of employees that they think have something going on. Um, so we've built a model that's centered around employees who are halfway through a point system or through a documentation process, whatever the employer has. And the success coach is personally reaching out to that employee to say, hey, is something going on? Because if we keep down this path, right, you're, you may lose your employment. And how do we keep them at work? And if somebody's at work, right, that gives them stability, that gives them a paycheck, they have a driving force. And so that's where our model really came from. Um, so we do go into those employers specifically on site every single week. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sorry. So in terms of alcohol and drug use, have you become aware of that? Are the employers aware of what's that for that's interesting. So um, we have 
of GLB agreements with most of our employees. And so unless they're telling the success coach it's impacting me at work, you know, we will advise and we will be there to have the conversation with your employer because they should know that you're struggling. But we are making those referrals to outside agencies to get them help and making sure that they're going and getting that help. The same is true for mental health. Even if we're making a referral to someone to go get assistance, we're gonna follow up. We're gonna send those text messages. Hey, what's going on? How'd it go? Did you make it to the appointment okay? Um, specifically around suicide prevention, that has come up a lot where the employer doesn't know but they say something to the success coach and it triggers it, whether that's while they're at work or not at work. And so there have been times that we've had to take people from their place of employment to go get them assistance. Uh, that really is one of the more difficult parts of being a success coach is those instances because you want to be that support, but you know at the end of the day, I make that referral that's on my hands, right? I will support you. I will still be your coach your cheerleader i'm going to check in with you um but at that point it really is up to that employee if they're getting that assistance that they need which is why it's so great to have resources and organizations like you guys in this room because the work that you do is really impactful and for us and employers to know that there's places that they can call at the drop of a hat and get someone help is really huge and if we're there to just happen to be the connecting point then that's what we are Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. Let's give them another hand. We would urge you and charge you to not let this information stay in your notebook. It hurts for a while in your mind. Please share this with your networks. Share this on the listservs. Call your friends. You know someone. Someone in your phone needs something that these panelists have. So please don't let this stay here. Take this out of your way. So again, thank you. And remember to visit our resource tables. And we appreciate you so much. Hello, oh, my name is Raymond Manier. I'm a school social worker with South Bend School Board, and I'm a clinician. Um, I will be the moderator for this session. We are going to run it the same way that we did with the adult panel. Uh, where each of our panelists will present, and then we will have questions in the end. Uh, so let me introduce, we are delighted to have three uh, youth panelists representing three different organizations serving youth and young adults who are building resilience in children and young adults in Michigan. We will have time again at the end of the presentations. We want to welcome HR Young. Uh, he is our executive director of the LGBTQ Center uh, we will be speaking about the youth drop in here and the Queer in the Mirror initiatives. Lindsay Locke is the program director of Ryan's Place, which is one of our support groups. And then Anna Swatsky is the director of The Source. Um, together, we rock partnerships for children. So, thank you again for being here and listening in. And then, thank you for the panelists. We'll start with HR. Thank you so much. Um, Again, I'm HR. Um, I've been with the LGBTQ Center for about four years. Uh, we are we do have a physical location over in St. Joseph County in South Bend. But uh, recently, in the last uh, three or four months, uh, starting in January, we started doing some program work over here in Elkhart County. And that, that kind of stemmed from during the pandemic, as if any of you have worked with youth, know that they hate Zoom, um, any kind of remote um, kind of learning or remote kind of interaction they really were not keen on. So uh, when the pandemic hit, we transitioned everything over to virtual for everybody. The adults, it was much, much easier for. Uh, they got on Zoom and no problems with there whatsoever. With the youth, however, there were several times that I was on a computer screen and it was all blank screens. Uh, the cameras turned off, the microphones turned off, this me talking. So what do you all think about this? <laughs> just staring at a black screen and uh, after a while the kids just stopped coming to that dropped off and so we moved to what was called discord uh some of you might be familiar with that i always say it's aol chat rooms from the 90s everything old is new again um and that worked out much better the 
kids are much more interactive on there. Um, you know, we, we can create a safe space for them, uh, you know, locking that down to make sure that we know who's in that room at any given time and that they're only there by invitation from us. And we have, we have met with them, we've made sure um, that they are who they say they are. Um, and it just gave them free range just to kind of communicate and build networks uh, in, in among themselves. What we did notice though was uh, as we were coming out of uh, such restrictions of meeting in person, starting to have those in, in person interactions with the kids for their drop ins, that we had a huge, I can say huge, but a, a big portion of the youth that we were interacting on uh, Discord were living over in Elkhart County. They had no way of getting to us for those in person drop ins, and we were struggling to keep them engaged because. As we started doing more in person, they started doing more in person, and that virtual connectivity through Discord kind of just went to the wayside for everyone. And so we were trying to find ways that we could still engage with that population that's over here in Elkhart County. And so we we've been really lucky, and uh, we started in January uh, just doing pop ups, and we do those kind of in rotation. And there's no set like the first Friday of the month, second Friday, because we're working at three locations. And you know, four to five Fridays in a month, so it kind of throws off our rotation. But uh, we do one here in the city of Elkhart, um, and then we're over in Bristol, and then we're now we're just starting down at the Big Brothers Big Sisters down in Goshen. So right now we have three cities or towns that we rotate through. Um, if you're looking for what the schedule is, I just suggest go to our website, which is really easy: the LGBTQ Center. Org and go to our calendar page and it, and it tells you which Friday where we are in Elkhart County. Um, for South Bend, that Friday night always stays at the center um, there in South Bend, so that makes it easy for that location. And then we also started doing some pop ups Thursday evenings in uh, St. Joseph County as well, uh, just to get more, more opportunities to connect with kids, for them to connect with each other, really. Uh, most of the time with our drop-in hours, it is literally just them hanging out and enjoying the, you know, camaraderie and friendships that they're building there. Um, we, we know that we have to start. Uh, if you've ever worked with kids who don't know each other, it's a lot of staring at the walls and not talking or interacting with each other. Uh, so we try to come up with some kind of activity. Um, they're more than welcome not to participate in the activity, but nine times out of the so, you know, arts and crafts, we bring over some uh, fun, fun activities for that. Uh, we also do some uh, creative writing exercises with them. We bring in some people who will do some writing. Um, we've also done in the past some movement classes, which they find uh, fun and embarrassing and humorous, um, especially if I get up and try to do some of those movements. Um, uh, so, and then we play games. Uh, a lot of times it's just games. And, you know, uh, it was great probably about three months ago, um, uh, Lauren, who does the South Bend side things, she's like, it was great. I had things planned, but none of them were interested in it. They just kind of came in and did their own thing. And that was really wonderful. I'm like, that's the goal. That's what we want to do, because we want them to have that experience of just building them those friendships. Because for a lot of them, uh, especially for the youth that we interact with, there are a lot of homeschool kids, um, so they don't get a lot of social interaction. And even when they do have that social interaction, they don't necessarily get to interact with other LGBTQ kids. Um, so this is an opportunity for them to kind of really, uh, really build those friendships and those relationships. The other important thing that we do on those uh, Friday nights is we feed them. Um, because we keep we know that's a draw, but also we, we have had in the past with kids who are, you know, with food resource insecurities. So, you know, we want to make sure that there is food for them there. Um, we have had kids who, you know, uh, on a light eating evening, we may have an extra pizza. They're like, can I take this pizza home? I'm like, absolutely. Because if you don't take it home, then I do. And then I get it, I probably should. So uh, we're very happy for them to, to take those, uh, take that food home with them. Something that we're really hoping to start bringing over uh, to Elkhart County as well is we started in January some cohort groups. Uh, there are about six, so here's my phone. Let's just step on. Sorry. Um, so cohort groups that uh, kind of sit around different things. We started off with a queer parent group, and that was for uh, parents who are LGBTQ themselves. Uh, they have specific challenges and uh, different things that come up. You know, 
sending kids to school, you know, how comfortable you feel about being two moms and uh, showing up there with, as two moms or two dads. And uh, how do you navigate some of those things? Um, how do you navigate friendships of your kids with other parents? And uh, just specific things like that. So we do a six week uh, intensive with them and then it becomes a monthly meeting um, for them just to kind of get together and network and, and then build friendships and whatnot through there. And then we started, it's called Queer in the Mirror. It is a suicide prevention program. It is there to just, uh, and we, we split it between adolescents, so 13 to 17, and then 18 to 24 for young adults. And that's just, it's a six week again, and we, we really focus in on, uh, you know, building up resiliency, building up, you know, because a lot of people come with a lot of anxiety and depression, and we talk a lot about coping skills and how can we make a plan to, you know, when you do feel anxiety or you do feel depression, who do you go talk to? Who are these safe people that you can interact with? And what resources can we connect you to that you can access as a teen? Um, did you throw up a two minute mark? Oh, okay, sorry, you are smiling. I was like, that's it. Um, and so uh, it's really built on giving them tools to help themselves with when they do need us. Um, something that we're starting this uh, uh, Saturday is uh, a healthy relationships. Uh, and that one is just for adolescents at this point. And it's not just dating. It is also what are kind of relationships you have with your friends? What relationships do you have with uh, schoolmates or teachers or uh, family members? And when you do have conflicts with them, how do you resolve those conflicts um, in, in a safe and, and productive way? Uh, but also, you know, what are red flags? You know, it's like, what are we accepting from our friendship relationships that are unhealthy? And how do we how do we have those conversations with friends about what is a good and healthy relationship? And then we'll start later in the summer. Um, another cohort group is called Proud and Empowered. That one is more geared toward specifically LGBTQ, um, uh, you know, history and uh, resources that are specifically for LGBTQ individuals. Um, and that one we got actually uh, through a partnership with the University of Washington in St. Louis. So uh, we're really excited to get that one started. And we're hoping that uh, probably after summer, after June, which is a very busy month for us, that we'll be able to start bringing some of those cohort group activities over here to the to the Elkhart County area. Our big five to 10 year plan is that we will have a physical location here in Elkhart County as well sometime within that five to 10 years. Um, so, you know, we, we know that we're, we, we have a huge geographical footprint, which is very interesting to me, but there's like no other resources really in the area. So we're it. And, you know, we, we have people coming from Fulton County and Miami County and Kosciuszko and uh, LaGrange and Noble and Elkhart and LaPorte and Porter and uh, up around Niles and Kosopolis. So, we get a lot of people coming to us. So we're really focusing on the next five to 10 years of how can we physically be in those locations uh, to make it a little easier for them to access um, those kinds of services uh, programs that we currently have. So that is the long and short of what we're, what we're doing in the way of youth programming. Um, but we do also offer uh, for adults 18 and over, we have peer led support groups uh, based on identities. We also have um, as I mentioned, the queer parent group means, but we also host PFLAG, uh, which is parents and friends of lesbians and gays. They've been around for about 40 some years, uh, but they, they meet at our location. And uh, it, that is a great, uh, great resource for those, of, uh, those parents who are not LGBTQ themselves, but they have LGBTQ kids. Um, and they, they, they need resources too, because their kids come out to them and they don't know what to do and they need a little bit more help. Um, so this is just a great or a great group of people to get together because it's, it really holds a lot of different people along their journey. So you'll have people who, a kid just came out yesterday um, and people are like, yeah, my kid's now 40. They came out when they were like 20 and you know, we, I, we've seen it all, we've gone through it. So when somebody, when a parent says, I have this issue, there's at least one parent in the room that can be like, yeah, I know. Like, like, this is how we dealt with it. This is how we, we kind of work through that. So that's why I really like the Peak Light group because it does come with a lot of experiences and you know, different parts of that journey. So, and that's, that's us in a nutshell. So thank you.
Lindsay Gidenlock, the program director at Ryan's Place. Um, sometimes I think that we're kind of a hidden gem. Um, in, by nature, what we do is build resiliency in kids. And there's a lot of familiar faces out here, some, some people have even uh, done some of our groups. But uh, quickly, our mission is uh, to provide uh, support in a safe environment for families, kids, and teens uh, as they are going through the healing process of grieving. Um, the last 21 years, we've served over 18,000 uh, people in the Michigan area. And last year, uh, about four, uh, more than 1,400. It's kind of hard to track our numbers because we do so many things. So uh, when you refer to us, uh, one of our big things that we do is um, our Monday night program where we have uh, support groups for all the way, age, all the way, age, all the way down to age three. Um, our little group is three to five-year-olds. And, um, and we have a lot of adult groups as well. The kids' groups are based on uh, their age. We do um, age-appropriate activities with them, um, crafts, activities that facilitate the healing, facilitate conversation. Um, and I think that, you know, when we talk about resiliency in kids, like kids are going to succeed the most when they feel heard, when they feel important, and when they don't feel alone. And that's really our goal for our groups. Um, I remember when I went into uh, first group, first through third grade group, and um, I, I tend to cheer up a lot. But uh, this one little boy, they went around the circle, we start, you know, our name and who died, and some silly icebreaker question. And he's just like, wow, I didn't know there were so many other kids that have had a mom die. And that's heartbreaking, but it's great, right? That he's there and that he is getting that kind of support. Um, when they come to our program, uh, we do feed our families, and that's a really important part of our program. Um, churches bring in home cooked meals, and otherwise, they get pizza. The kids don't seem to mind the pizza very much. Because, <laughs> um, you know, after someone dies, uh, that empty space at the table can be so painful. So, for some families, I hear, you know, this is the only time we actually sit down and eat together. Because uh, we're maybe it's now a new single mom, new single dad. You know, rushing from practice to practice to practice to be what they had for their kids. Um, there was one family that came, a grandpa and his grandkid, he was raising his two grandkids, and the little one little crank is like, you know what, Lindsay, this is grandpa's favorite night of the week because he doesn't have to do dishes. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, there's another, and I have to be careful because I can go off on this. Um, but to speak to the importance and the, the empowerment, having these kids feel safe and heard. Uh, there was this one family that came around Thanksgiving. Um, there was a mom and her daughter, and their dad had died. Her dad had died. And during dinner, um, I was told the second hand, but there was a this, there was a staff member sitting at the table that you know she was just the little girl was like shoveling in those mashed potatoes, like bless these bless these uh, churches who bring in home with food, um, and the mom just, you know, said, I have not been able to get her to eat since her dad died. And the kid, of course, was like, oh, well, that's because these mashed potatoes are better than yours, mom. <laughs> but, but I mean, it speaks to the power of, of it being their space. Um, we also have our school-based programs. Uh, so if, if people can't come to our program nights, um, we do go out to the community schools. Chris Seminarium is over there, coordinates all of that. Um, and that's a 10 week program. Um, and often like in school, so like adults, we, we're, we're grieving, we need support. We'll, I'll call up Anna over here and talk to her. Um, but kids aren't gonna go on the playground and say, hey, can I talk to you about like, like my grandpa died and I'm feeling really upset and sad. Um, so for them to find that there's other kids in the schools uh, that have had somebody die is just life changing for them. We often hear from families from, um, from parents, whether it's a school program, whether it's the Monday night program, um, whether it's one of our camps, that they just feel like their kids are really, but they really benefit, that their behavior changes, they're able to sleep better, eat better, um, that they just seem to be lighter. Um, so, I'm going to look at my notes for So, yeah, um, along with that, we also do crisis call outs. Uh, we do some individual counseling. We get referrals from, I know, counselors for an Oakland for individual counseling. Um, that's provided by our MSW interns, and I know like a lot of you were low on interns right now. Um, so our main focus is support, is support groups. We also have a camp coming up this summer. Uh, they can register on our website. Uh, you don't have to, they don't have to be in Goshen to participate. We have people come from 
Kosciuszko County, uh, even up in Michigan, South Bend. Um, we also have uh, a Spanish-speaking staff, and so on our program banks, there is a Spanish-speaking uh, group, uh, which is huge. We also have volunteers that speak Pennsylvania Dutch, because uh, we do serve the Amish as well. Um, you know, I think that when kids are grieving, one thing that they're grieving is that they don't have any choice. They feel they feel like all their power is taken away, and it is. They, they feel choose to have somebody die. So we do the best that we can to give them choices in their in their activities that they do. Um, and and yeah, I think that the kids that go through our program, um, our goal is just for them to feel um, like it's a safe space, and that's huge in foster resiliency. And then also another thing that um, I mean, they found the JAG Institute um, has done enough research that. When, when grief support is given at critical points in a kid's life, uh, the likelihood of prolonged mental illness decreases, and the risk of what we call deviant behaviors, like turning to drugs, to alcohol, to joining gangs, that decreases as well. Um, and also what we do is we support the whole family. So um, kids are also gonna do better when their parents, when their caregivers are doing better. And so that's a huge part of our program is that families can all go into their own separate group on a program night and all get support. Um, we end with the Ryan's Place song at uh, the end of our program night, at our Monday night program. And uh, there was a, a mom that, that called me, we were talking on the phone, and she's like, my little, she has a fourth grader or a third grader. And she's like, we were at an amusement park. And, Little Johnny was singing a song like over and over and over again. And I asked him, like, what? Because it was so loud. She couldn't hear what he was singing. She's like, what are you singing? He's like, well, the riots I saw, Mom. And, and it does get stuck in your head. And she just, you know, teared up and said, that tells me that this is a safe place for my kid. And that you're giving him a space where he doesn't feel alone. And that to me speaks to resiliency. Um, one in 11 children. Uh, will experience the death of a parent or a sibling by the age of 18 here in Indiana. That is more than the na national average. Um, and so, I mean, the need is there. The need is there. Um, and we appreciate your guys' referrals. I hope that you're like making mental notes of questions because I really like questions. I can come up and talk and talk and talk. Um, but I don't know if I cover everything. Um, and there's no time limit uh, for people that are coming to our program, you know, after several years, the average length that people come into our groups, I mean, the school groups are 10 years, uh, but the average length that people come is about like 18 months to two years. And then we're working on starting a on an ongoing support group uh, that would meet that need as well. Um, as far as uh, we do have a suicide treatment group as well. I know that that's a huge need. If I have enough facilitators and enough space, which right now we are maxed out, uh, we're housed out of Silverwood Mennonite Church in Goshen. Um, we have our office downtown and then we rented an art space as well. But if I get the right get enough space or get the facilitators, I would love to have an accidental overdose group for both uh, teens, kids, and adults. Because I could we could form with our, our teen group right now, we could have a, a good sized group already of those that have had a parent or sibling die of an accidental overdose. Um, and yeah, I mean, our, our art groups uh, meets every other Saturday. Um, it's housed out of the old CCYC Arborage Daycare uh, building. Um, and that is for adults only, although this summer with our intern, I'm hoping to have an art express, expressive art group for our kids as well. Um, we love partnering. So there's a lot of agencies, a lot of different um, organizations in this room reach out. We've done groups at Basher. We've done groups at Oakland. We've done um, groups at the JBC ongoing. And what you're going to find is, you know, the, the only group that, that it's not required that you have, you've had somebody in your life die is the JBC. But you, what we find, and what I found, is that more likely than not, everybody in that group would have experienced some sort of death or trauma, um, as, well, as well as the trauma and loss of freedom uh, in the JBC group. Um, yeah, so we have, we, we, we go where there's need. Um, hopefully sometime we will have our own space um, and be able to do even more. Yeah. So 
what are you guys most excited about in spring? What are those things? Flowers. Sun. Being outside. Or Okay, well, so that was all the trick to get you to say flowers and you got right there. And so, <laughs> so I'm Anna with The Source, which is Elkhart County's system of care. And there are lots of different ways to think about a system of care, but I'm going to go with the flower image. So because really we're looking at children and families at the center. So if we take that as the center of the family and then the system of care says, how do we wrap around children and and families in our community with the supports that they need to do well. And how do we make sure that all of those pebbles, so that's all of us, how do we make sure that we are overlapping in the right ways where there aren't huge gaps and where we're not all doing the same work, where we each have our part in supporting the families and we're doing that collaboratively as well. So our, uh, official sort of thing, our vision is that we believe that mental health and emotional wellness of our children is a public health issue. So this is about all of us, not just about, you know, these, these kids need to do better or whatever, um, or these families need to do better, but this is all of us. And it's a collaborative network of people and organizations who are concerned about children's mental health. It's what makes up the source. So a lot of our role is just in that convening, facilitating sort of thing. We're governed, I guess, we're hosted at Ocon, governed by the community team, which is a whole bunch of different organizations. I see at least one community team member here um, who provide that oversight and I meet with monthly and who we talk about what's needed and that kind of thing. But then we do have some other programs. So one of our programs is Partnership for Children. Again, a whole bunch of partners here. And Partnership, Partnership for Children came about when, I think it was mostly the Boys and Girls Club initially said, uh, we're having to kick kids out. We don't want to kick kids out. That's not good, but we can't keep everybody safe. There are behavioral issues happening that we can't manage. And so all of these different organizations came together, went to the Community Foundation and got funding to, to do it. And so it's kind of developed into two things that we do to prevent that sort of problem. So one is skills training for the kids. If the kids just need somebody to get in there and work with them in these settings so that they can do better in those settings, we provide skills training. And then the other side of that is training for partners, for all of us. So a lot of our, probably all of you have been yes, training. Um, so doing training so that instead of each agency having to go out and seek out training in different things, we can pull together and do that all together. So PFC provides trainings and then the skills training piece. We also then have uh, Together We Rock is a, a cohort model of bringing together early childhood champions, I guess is one of the ways you say it. So, uh, working in early childhood centers, daycares, preschools, all those kinds of things, using the conscious discipline model, and then doing coaching for those providers uh, and uh, educational groups, I guess. So cohort get-togethers. And then out of that is also the ROC team, which is a multidisciplinary approach to children struggling in preschool. So this is a new stat for me. Apparently, Expulsions in preschool, that's the highest expulsion rate of any other grade in school all the way up through 12th grade, which is kind of fascinating. Like so, and none of that is anybody being ill-intentioned or trying to take the kids out or not understanding. It's just when you don't know how to keep the other kids safe or when you're just not equipped to deal with that, you don't have the staffing and all of that, that's what you do. Uh, and there are none of those sort of legal protections there are or legal or resources that there are at later school levels. So rock teams can come together and help preschools staff a particular case, put together a multidisciplinary team to sit with that provider and figure out some solutions and how can we work together. Uh, so those are some of the big programming things. Yeah, um, all of it is about promoting youth resilience, although I will say, so originally system of care came about through wraparound. So when you take a kid with pretty extreme emotional behavioral issues and figure out what are the resources we wrap around that kid to do well. 
We've now brought that all the way down to the bottom of the public health pyramid. So right at that level of kids who are still doing okay, how can we prevent escalation up into, into worse problems? So how do we wrap the community around children and youth at every stage? Oh, I think if there were other specific programs that would do it. So yeah, and oh, and I guess I will say one more thing, just in terms of the prevention promotion side. Um, social marketing has been a big part of the source from the start. So one of the big campaigns been the "It's okay to ask" campaign. So just getting that word out there that you've got a problem, it's okay to ask, whether you're a parent, a child, somebody else, it's okay to ask for help. And then along with that, and this is about all of us, it's this concept of there's no wrong door in Ohio County. So no matter, you know, if you go to any of these guys and they need something I've got, I'll refer, you know, they'll refer to me. If I've got something, you know, anybody else needs, we'll, we'll send somebody out there that we're, um, as they said at United Way and South Bend, prevent the bounce, stop the bounce, where we get a kid in and bounce them off to somebody else. But actually like that warm hand off, how do we get them there? How do we get them where they need to be and ensure that that is where they need to be and they're going to get them in? So I'll stop there and leave room for questions. Can you hear me? I've used all of these. They're great. I really appreciate them. Um, they've been great resources for me in my own work. Um, so now we will start with questions. So go ahead and come on up again like we did the adult panel um, and ask your questions. I, I figured out a habit. I did want to mention that if you want to refer somebody uh, to Ryan Space, just have them call our, our phone number, 574 535 And also, a question we get often is uh, the cost. All of our services are free of charge uh, to families um, across the board. So, yeah. Four kids to get services at the LG. Center, do they have to be out to their parents or do their parents have to authorize their working there? No, they don't. Um, we don't have many kids that aren't out to their parents, which is a really wonderful thing. Uh, but we we will, um, uh, they are more than welcome to come. Uh, we don't ask, you know, it's not like we like show us your card or you LGBTQ and you come in. I know, we, I know we've had some straight ally. Uh, friends who, who come to different things. So we don't really have to ask that question specifically. Um, now, when we do certain activities and things, we do ask them to get parents permission uh, because just because of the nature of those sorts of things, we just want to make sure that parents know. Uh, like when we, if we do a field trip or anything like that, we just want to make sure the parents are on board, no, but otherwise, no, they don't have to be out to their parents. So. I thought of something else too, just in terms of referrals, and I don't know if everybody knows this, but one of the other things we can do under the grant funding we have right now is pay for therapy services for anybody under 18 going through Oakland who's under underinsured. And so, you know, hopefully if you send somebody to Oakland, that just that gets communicated once they get there. But if you're unsure, uh, always reach out to me or somebody else if you want to know how to how to access that. I just have a comment about that. I've done a lot of uh, referring. So I just wanted to mention that as someone who works with people from uh, a variety of different circumstances, that this grant that the source helps with has been able to provide so much services and needed help for families that have had literally no other barrier besides finances. So if finances is like the number one issue for families, um, that is no longer a barrier in our um, I guess the St. Jones are doing that Yeah, so at least Elkhart County, I know Elkhart County, so, um, but yeah, I think that's been a huge benefit, so that's definitely a selling point. That includes underinsured if deductibles or copays are too high to afford. Any questions? What is 
the age range for your center? Uh, for the for the youth programming, it is 12 to 18. 12 to 18? Yes. Uh, we do. Um, it is more referrals over to Mosaic, um, and, and they refer, you know, especially with the youth over here in the Elkhart County area. They, they they let them know what's happening and when it's happening. So yes, we have a great relationship with Mosaic. We love them. So. <clears throat> Just curious. In terms of, kind of what's been happening within schools and school boards, are, are people talking to you? Are they asking you as an expert to come in and talk about why you know policies or how policies set at the school? It's depending on the school district. Um, I, I have had many conversations with um, school counselors. Um, we have been asked to come in. I know. Right. Um, as we came in for, I think I think I've met with the empowerment zone school counselors, as well as uh, uh, South Bend City Schools as well. Um, I have talked to some school board members who reached out to ask about specific policies that they've um, considered or have been floated, um, and just kind of talking through them. We there was one that came up, and uh, I just kind of said, you know, I, I I feel the intention that you're going for, but the outcome is going to be. Um, because it was one of those that was basically going to, well, now it's going to happen because it's now state law, but forcefully outing kids. If a kid came to you as a teacher and find it in you, it, they would basically have to turn around and tell the parent that the, the kid was LGBTQ, which, um, interestingly enough, still in year 2023, about one in four LGBTQ kids who come out to their families are kicked out of the house. Um, and that kicking out of the house is not necessarily a parent saying get out because if they do that, then the parent is neglecting and they can go to jail for that. So what the parents do a lot of times is they will make life so unbearable at home for the kid that the kid runs away because then that's not their fault. So, um, you know, I always like to tell people like, I, I get where you're coming from and wanting to, you know, make sure that, you know, the parents and the kids are on the same page, but that is not always the case. You know, I always say, you wanna make sure before you let parents know that the kid knows that and do they feel safe with the parents knowing that because it could be a bad situation. You know, I, when I worked down in Indianapolis at Indiana Youth Group, there was a kid there that um, he, his, his, he didn't know his dad, but he was living with his mom and now he lives with his grandparents because when he came out to his mom, his mom shot him, trying to kill him. His mom is now in jail for attempted murder. So it's like, that's why I, 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 I always tell that story because like that is a real life incident. Does that happen every single time? No, it doesn't, thankfully. But that is why just blanketly saying, if a kid comes to me and uh, says that they're LGBTQ, that I'm gonna immediately tell their parents, I'm like, I, I will not do that uh, without you know first knowing that it is a safe environment for the kid to go back to. So that's kind of where we're at. So. great to have HR come to our um, like our social work meeting to talk to us and kind of educate us and guide us into these new bills that are coming out um, and just kind of give us some insight. So they're great resources. Any other questions? I want to thank the panelists again for their time and coming out. for hanging in there all afternoon and for being here. I hope that everybody's learned something new today. Um, and I think our resource tables are going to be out there for another little while. Um, so I'm big on evaluations and hearing what people's experience has been. So please QR code, pull it up. Uh, and also at 4 o'clock, you'll get a uh, link uh, with the evaluation. So please give us feedback. Um, we are looking to grow our impact in and connections in Elkhart County. So if they're if you're thinking about um, public education, so healthy relationships is something that we do as well. Um, we'll go out into community organizations and do some of our classes and we do trainings as well. So um, 
we're open to make connections. So please email us, let us know if you're interested in partnerships. So thank you so much for being here today. And thank you all for being here as well. Thank you.